No, you don't understand where you've got your lights in. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to take your seats, we will begin. Um, very special pleasure this evening to have Professor Georgina Mace with us. Um, we were successful in, I say we, I have nothing to do with me, but UCL was successful in luring Georgina from Imperial College uh, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, where she was uh, head of the Centre for Population Biology. And before that, she was Director of Science at the Zoological Society of London. You will know that the UCL Institute of Sustainable Resources and indeed the UCL Energy Institute, which is uh, the, 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 the groups that are hosting this lecture, we're very multidisciplinary, so I always ask people what their disciplines are. <laughs> and and uh, uh, Georgina said she had lots of disciplines, which is exactly the kind of person that we like. So she started off as a conservation biologist, which is a kind of very recognizable discipline, and then migrated to become an ecologist, which I suppose is kind of recognizable, and now describes herself as a biodiversity scientist, which sounds <laughs> infinitely more interesting. And that's what she's going to be talking about this evening. She now heads up the <coughs> Centre for Biodiversity and Environment Research here at UCL. Very kindly is supervising two of our PhDs in the UCL ISR uh, PhD program. So without more ado, welcome Georgina. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for inviting me. And um, yeah, the reason I don't know what discipline is because I, my expertise is very broadly spread, as you're going to discover, which means I don't know much about anything, but I know a lot about lots of things. So um, what I'm going to do in this talk is, um, well, I try and, I'm trying to try and talk about biodiversity in a way that's relevant for the ISR interests. Um, so I'll start a little bit with just introducing what we mean by global biodiversity and status and trends, what we know, and then um, talk about why it matters. Why should the world care about biodiversity? Then I, I'll just briefly go through some work we've been doing recently about a planetary boundary for biodiversity, um, relating to this broader discussion about planetary boundaries and sustainability. And then at the very end, I'll quickly uh, talk about some ways ahead, but I don't really have enough time uh, to do all of that. So firstly, um, what is biodiversity? So it's one of these words that's kind of bandied about and means, in fact, in, it's a formally, I think it's a very contested term. It means different things to different people. To some people, it means species richness, how many species there are. It's probably the most iconic measure of biodiversity. But it's also used quite broadly to mean nature or even wilderness or kind of intactness, the amount of the natural world that has not already been transformed for people's needs. So in this talk, I'm going to use the term in the way that the Convention on Biological Diversity defines it, which is about the variety of life at all levels, so from genes through populations, um, species and ecosystems, wherever it is, land, water, air. And rather importantly, and I think it was very prescient of the um, CBD to recognize this, they actually do recognize, they don't quite put it in these terms, but it's about all the stuff that goes on between bits of biodiversity. It's about the interactions between living things as well. So it's not just counting up all the units, it's also these interconnections within food webs, ecosystems, and so on. So an important thing about life on Earth is it's very big and very complicated, and most of it we don't know very much about. So this is a tree of all the life on Earth, Here's the animals that you'll be familiar with here. Here are plants and here are fungi. But most of the diversity on Earth is actually um, in these groups of bacteria in the archaea, uh, not in the organisms that we tend to think about and recognize. And most of what we know about life on Earth is in these groups, the animals, the plants, uh, maybe the fungi, maybe some of the um, prokaryotes, but, but not a lot. And so. When we think about biodiversity, and most of the data that I'm going to show you is about these bits that we know about, animals and plants. But as I'll come on to talk about, it may be that when we think about uh, changes to the environment, what matters more is some of these other components that we know less about. 
So just uh, thinking about the um, parts of that tree that we know reasonably well. So now I'm going to talk just about the animals and the plants and the fungi. Um, this is a, 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 it's a rather strange graph, I know, but this is sort of an estimate of the number of species that there might be, even though we haven't described them. So these are the known unknowns, if you like. Um, so the long pink bar is the number of, in this case, insects and myriapods that are not yet described, somewhere up to about 8 million in total, of which maybe we've described about a million. And you can see here are the vertebrates, um, of which there are, I don't know, 70,000 or something. So we're one of those. They're pretty well known. We don't often discover new species of vertebrates. But we very often discover new species up here, particularly in beetles. Um, the plants are a very functionally important group. We know reasonably well, although not completely. But other groups that are really important, like the fungi um, and the nematodes, are again very poorly understood. So it's kind of an important thing to understand about biodiversity. We think we know what we're talking about, but actually quite a lot of the time um, we really don't have a, a good catalogue of life on Earth. So what I'm going to do is run through what we know about the status of global biodiversity using that CBD definition of um, within species, of species, and above the species level, and see what we know about current status and trends. So this is some composite data from composite indices of various <coughs> populations of living organisms from 1970 to about 2010. So these are all standardized to be one back in 1970, and these are the trends in the local abundance of population. So this isn't the number of species, this is just about the local abundance, how many individuals of each of those populations are there. So, for example, this is the Living Planet Index. Ben Collin, who's here, <coughs> used to put a lot of this data together. This is what's happened to the Living Planet Index. It's probably the biggest one in here um, over that 30, 40 year period. And it's declined by about a third, up to about a third. Um, some of the others have seen more serious declines. This, is, this one here is common farmland birds, which have seen a much bigger decline. Uh, something completely inexplicable has happened to European grassland butterflies, which I can't quite explain to you, but they went up but have now declined very radically. Um, this is a wild bird index, this is a water bird index. Coral reef condition took a big hit in the 1980s and continues to uh, decline. So over all that vast number of species put into each of these indices, roughly about a third of abundance has been lost in that period since 1970. So that's a pretty serious loss. You might argue that some of these declines have leveled off, and I think that's probably true, uh, particularly in the temperate um, uh, species in here, perhaps not in the tropics. So that's what's happening to local populations. Now, of course, if all individuals from local populations decline, eventually the species goes extinct. And that's really the iconic measure of um, biodiversity loss. So the problem about extinctions is they're incredibly difficult to measure. To know something has gone is really tricky. Uh, you have to go on looking and looking and looking and then decide it's not there. It's just a very hard thing to do. So almost certainly we undercount extinctions. We also undercount them for very good reasons, that you don't name a species as extinct until you're absolutely sure it is, because there's no way you can get conservation money to <coughs> conserve it if you've called it extinct. But even so, um, the number of uh, species, this is the number that are actually named and certified extinct uh, since 1500. And you can see, well, th there's about eight to 900 here but it's from a rather small number of species that have been looked at. So this is maybe a third or a quarter of all the vertebrates that have even been thought about to decide if they're extinct. This is less than 0.1% of all the invertebrates and uh, again a small proportion of the plants. So counting extinctions is a really bad way to measure biodiversity loss. It just is so incomplete and so hard to do and so unlikely to underrepresent what's actually happening. So another way to do it is to look at rates of um, threat. What are the extinction risk of currently extant species? And this is a plot 
taken from IUCN's uh, red list assessments across a whole set of groups, amphibians, fish, mammals, reptiles, birds, corals, crayfish, crabs, cycads, conifers and seagrasses. And this is the proportion that are listed as threatened. So anything that's either red, orange or yellow is at risk of extinction. Grey ones couldn't be assessed and green ones are in this category that means safe, although it's not called safe, it's called least concern. So obviously that um, proportion varies a lot between groups. For, for the amphibians, for example, there's about a third are listed as threatened. For the birds, it's about 11%. And some of these um, plant groups, but well, cycads, which is an endemic group of South African plants, it's very high. It's quite a small group, though. Um, but this is kind of varying between 10 and 30 percent for most groups, with a varying number that are in the most critically endangered groups. So that's a very, that's quite a serious picture that that proportion of species are thought to be at risk of extinction. And one of the things that you can do if you keep doing these assessments over time is to look at trends in the, um, in, in the conservation status of species. Um, and that's what this plot is. This is the red list index, which is a kind of average um, level of endangerment for each of these groups measured over time. It's a slightly complicated index, but if everything was one and the line was horizontal, we'd be fine. There would be no threatened species. The lower the line is, uh, the greater the proportion that's already at risk, and the steeper the decline, the faster species are moving up those categories of threat towards extinction. And so the rate of increase in threats in amphibians is high, and they're also more endangered at the moment than, say, mammals or birds. So we're, we're starting to be able to put together these data that give you some projected um, rates of species loss, particularly for these well-known groups. But again, um, that's quite difficult. We're still only looking at the species that we know particularly well. If there were, I don't know, 60 or 70,000 species in this assessment, there's a whole load that we're not looking at at all. And so another way to do that is just to look at the world's biomes. So biomes are major um, vegetation types in the world. They're kind of coherent in terms of their structure and function tropical rainforests, temperate forests, savannas, tundra and so on. And by looking at the extent to which different biomes are being converted, losing that integrity, you can get some idea of what's happening to all the species that are um, representative of that biome. So this is a way of thinking about more broadly about the other plants, the other invertebrates that are endemic to biomes. And it's easier to collect this information on transformation of, of biomes over time. So this is some data that was put together for the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Here are the bio... Oops, sorry. Um, oops. Here are... Oh, hang on, sorry. Here are the different biomes. This is Mediterranean forests, temperate forests, going down into tropical, uh, tropical savannas, tropical coniferous forests, deserts, tundra and so on. And the light pink is the amount of the total area that had been converted by 1950. So quite a long historical um, period it, during which that conversion took place, the Mediterranean temperate zones. Uh, the orange bit is the amount of conversion that took place between 1950 and 1990. And then the dark red bit with the error bar is the projected conversion from 1990 to 2050. So you can see this pattern that historically most of the conversion was in these Mediterranean temperate forests and woodlands, a sort of historical expansion um, in Europe and North America <coughs> that removed vast tracts of um, intact uh, forest and woodland and grassland, actually. And that's pretty much stopped now. In fact, this temperate um, forest and woodland has recovered. That's why there's a minus conversion. We've had some recovery in, um, in North America and Europe. But the next swathe, these dark red bars here, are all in the tropical areas. So those will be the next bits of habitat to be converted. And that's pretty serious for biodiversity because these are the areas that have uh, the highest species richness and the highest richness of endemic species. So that's telling us something about impending losses that you don't see from any of the figures I've shown so far. So, of course, the reason that all this happens is that 
people are um, increasingly um, using the land surface for our own needs. So this is a map of what's called human appropriation of net primary productivity, HAMP. So it's about, it's about all of the primary productivity that plants are producing. What proportion of it is directly or indirectly used by people? And anywhere that this is sort of orange or brown, you're looking at 50% or more of the total net primary productivity is just for people. So that's a, um, in, a, in these areas of high human population and, and um, high agricultural land value, uh, large amounts of the Earth's surface. And that trend is also increasing. So this is that HAMP uh, measure over time. Oh, sorry, I've lost a bit of a graph here. Uh, that's going uh, over the last uh, 100 years or so. And he here you can see, actually, uh, if you compare it per capita and per GDP, we're getting more efficient at it. We're, um, and actually, per harv harvested, uh, hand per harvested hand is, um, is pretty efficient. So we're getting better at it. But even so, uh, the amount of, uh, the number of people and the extent to which you're putting demands on the landscape mean that um, this trend uh, of, of um, total amount of hand used by people is going to go on increasing. So those <coughs> pressures on the landscape uh, must increase over time. And uh, I know I've talked mostly about terrestrial systems and I'm not going to talk much about marine areas, but just to say the same is true in the oceans. Uh, this is actually, I think, a, one of these things called expert opinion assessment of um, uh, human impacts in marine systems and the, and the main message is there's hardly anywhere uh, that isn't already impacted by people in some way and most of the oceans um, are impacted what they call I have no idea what this means medium high impact 8.47 to 12 that's, that's, that's quite a lot whatever it is so people's impact on the earth um, is substantial and increasing so just to look forward then on species extinction rates, this iconic measure, um, this is about the best you can get to of comparing extinction rates in the past. So this is um, extinction rates for mammals in the Cenozoic compared with extinction rates today measured from the red list. So that rather conservative data I showed you about the number of extinct species is the bottom of that. And the top of that says, let's assume all the really critically endangered ones go extinct. And this axis here is what's called extinctions per million species year. So it's just a way of calibrating um, a small number of species measured over long periods of time here against a large number of species measured over a short period of time here. So you, what you can see between those two is that the extinction rate, at least of, of vertebrates, has increased by 100 times. Um, from compared to Cenozoic times. Um, now, if we go into the future, projecting forward climate change, land use change, or multiple drivers, then this may increase another by another two orders of magnitude. But there's great uncertainty about it. Um, uh, even under, and there's some estimates under climate change that will get up to, um, you know, another thousand times or ten thousand times increase in the extinction rate. But there's other estimates that say actually where we are now for mammals, birds and amphibians is about as bad as it's going to get. And um, this is a huge challenge to narrow down these um, extinction risk estimates for the future. To some extent you can't even do it because it depends what people do and depends what happens with climate change. So I'm going to try and summarise this rather complicated picture about what's happening to biodiversity. So this is about biodiversity loss. And the main way that you lose biodiversity is with it, extinction. So there are extinctions going on, and that's pretty, um, well, it's, it's very serious because it's irreversible. When that goes, it goes. But there's also a huge amount of biodiversity alteration going on. Species are moving their ranges. In particular, ranges are narrowing, abundance is reducing. Uh, as abundance reduces and ranges narrow, there are changes in uh, abundance and community structure, and all of these things lead to loss of genetic diversity. 
And it's, it's sort of in here that we have real concerns because that genetic diversity is the entire library of life, if you like. But over here, uh, the alteration is all the things that are fundamentally altering what goes on within ecosystems. So what's, this is a little summary for global biodiversity. There are, there are many species in decline, mostly seen as a, a loss of abundance and range. There are more threatened species and extinction risk is increasing over time. We have these extinction rates about 100 times background rate, but that will increase. Big differences among major taxa. But locally, uh, many areas have not witnessed many extinctions. So it's very hard for people to appreciate what's actually going on. And in fact, in many areas, species numbers have increased. And actually, I came across this really interesting plot of plant species in Germany. Uh, so this is showing back to Neolithicum, so 7,000 years ago. Here's the original German uh, flora from way back um, at the end of the last uh, ice ages, basically. Uh, it was down here. And if you just trace through those ancient um, what you might call the real native species for Germany. There's a small number here that have gone extinct, and then there's a number that are endangered. But it's actually quite small. But that is overwhelmed by this, which is all the, what, what are called alien species, so the ones that have invaded from elsewhere, that have come into Germany. Now, whether you call it, exactly how you term these things um, is, is quite complicated. But you can see there's been a huge number of species arriving, of those, some of them are endangered and some of them are, are, um, have gone extinct. Some of them invade and then die out. But the total species count is actually much higher than, than it was. So that, but, but that's against this backdrop that we're losing global biodiversity. You're kind of mixing it up, homogenizing um, diversity generally. So now I want to go on and talk about why does it matter. So we're losing and changing biodiversity in a big way. I'm going to talk about why does it matter in three headings. One of them I won't spend much time on, which is the first one, uh, just because it's there, the intrinsic value. Uh, then I want to talk about the genetic library of life, and then I want to talk about these instrumental and extrinsic values, uh, natural capital and ecosystem services. So intrinsic values, this is why most people think they worry about biodiversity, because it's there, and this is the rest of life on Earth, and it has a right to exist. and um, it's, it's very difficult to talk any more about than that. It's just that because it's there, it has a right, but it doesn't let you do any prioritization. It doesn't let you um, weigh one thing up against another, and it's, it's just a very difficult debate to have. So I'm just going to acknowledge that for many people, that's their major concern about nature and life on Earth. Um, and it has to be dealt with somehow, but it's quite hard to know how to deal with it in a, in a pressured world. I think a much more tangible way to think about uh, loss of life on Earth is around this loss of the genetic library. And this is really the iconic measure of, of, um, of diversity, is the total amount of genetic variability in all the living organisms on the Earth is the fundamental measure of diversity. And it is the source of all innovation, adaptability and resilience. Once we lose that variation, you can't get it back again. That is the really irreversible bit. Well, actually, there's all this synthetic biology ideas now about getting it back. But I think um, it's worth just proceeding at the moment on the basis that we can't get it back. And, um, and that tree of life, of course, is huge. And it's really hard to get a grasp on um, how big it is. This, if anyone wants to, this is a really nice um, fractal tree of life. It's called One Zoom, where you can actually climb up the branches and you can see this is man up here, people are here, but you can see, you can kind of delve into the fractal tree of life and see the length of these branches and how much is at risk. And so for any, if it were the case that um, extinction was just kind of randomly distributed across this tree, you could lose whole branches, or you could lose species without losing very much, little bits on the end would fall off. But actually, uh, for lots of reasons, uh, threat tends to be concentrated around branches, both because related species share traits and because threat tends to be focused geographically and so does evolutionary history. And so a lot of threat is around whole branches. So this here 
I think this is the monotremes, that's the duck-billed platypus, and this is some echidnas. So that whole branch, for example, is quite endangered, and you can lose the whole thing. And when you lose that diversity, it's gone forever. You've lost millions of years of unique adaptation to some particular environment. And um, there's been a, there was an interesting study recently that looked at this for um, plants, birds, and mammals in Europe. Let's assume that um, all the species that lose their climate-based ranges uh, go extinct under climate change in Europe. What happens to all that genetic variability? And so you can see that the <coughs> sort of, I mean, it's obviously a sampling factor. There's all the threatened ones go extinct, and you lose uh, variability. Um, where the, the extent to which you lose it depends on how that variability is patterned in the, in the phylogeny, but it, it may be pretty serious. So lo loss of genetic variability is a, is a key concern. The other one I'm going to talk a bit about is, um, is the, are these extrinsic values. So uh, actually we depend on life on Earth, the rest of life on Earth, for most of the things that we take for granted. And there's a lot of terminology around this but um, ecosystem processes, functions, services, natural capital, these are the things that ultimately provide us with food, fibre, fuel, with a lot of the regulating services, climate regulation, protection against natural hazards, pathogen and pest regulation, soil quality, regulation of natural regulation of water quality and quantity. Um, a lot of these cultural values around sense of place, identity, aesthetic enjoyment, and so on, and these evolutionary benefits from, from novel genetic resources. So those are important um, extrinsic values that we get from nature. And in the last few years, there's been a lot of effort to try and um, be a, get a bit more tangible measurements of what nature is doing for society and what nature is doing for the economy. So one way to structure this, um, the, the sort of ecosystem services, goods and benefits argument, is that we look at these things that are going on in ecosystems <coughs> anyway. These are things that people didn't make happen. Uh, nature would do all this without us ever intervening. Nutrient cycling, primary production, decomposition. These are just fundamental ecosystem processes. All those bacteria and microorganisms and plants are doing all this for their own benefit. They're not doing it for us. But what we can do is um, use some of that system to underpin our own production. So for example, um, trees are a service that come from ecosystems. And we use trees because they provide us with goods that are important, such as timber. Now those, those don't come without some input. You have to manage it and you have to put some nutrients in and so on. But you can figure out how much of this traces back to that and in fact how much of it traces back to trees and that's the sort of argument about ecosystem services so the, but the complicated thing here is where does biodiversity sit in there and this is very complicated because it sits in all three of these there's biodiversity within the fundamental processes within the services themselves you want diversity in here and then there are some things that we just value on their own um, uh, as goods that are part of biodiversity. But rather crucially, the kinds of species and ecosystems at each of these levels are different. So down here, in the, uh, sorry, in the um, ecosystem processes, we're mostly looking at um, a lot of microorganisms, uh, plants and primary producers, um, bacteria and so on. Here we're tending to look at um, plants, wild crop, livestock relatives, and here we're looking at these charismatic vertebrates and plants that people value for their own sake. And so most of the things that underpin fundamental ecosystem services are uh, plants and below ground invertebrates. They're not things that I was showing you extinction rates of. And most ecosystem services are taking place in grasslands and soils, freshwater forests. So then the question is, what happens when we lose diversity here what happens to the quality and reliability of those ecosystem functions and services? And this has been a, a, a lively area of research for a number of years now of manipulating diversity um, in managed systems 
to look at what happens to these ecosystem functions, um, particularly production, primary production, decomposition, nutrient cycling, these fundamental ecological processes. And this is a very rough uh, composite curve of what happens there. So mostly, uh, the more diversity you have, and this is controlling for biomass and controlling for composition, uh, the, the more diversity you have, the better that ecosystem function. So if you lose um, substantial numbers of species, you will get lower um, production rates, lower decomposition and so on. But there's a huge amount of variation. And very crucially, uh, when you go down to just one species, to a monoculture, there's a massive amount of variation. So one species on its own may actually be better than you could possibly get even with the greatest number of species. And of course that is what agriculture is. It's picking that one species that's highly productive in a particular place at a particular time. Um, and this would be the worst species to try and turn into a productive crop or whatever. But um, if, you if you look at this relationship in a changing world or in a, in a more unpredictable environment, then it's better to be somewhere in the middle here to have more diversity because you can sample different species to be this highly effective one. So it's quite a complicated um, set of relationships. Now that is about these fundamental ecosystem functions and processes. It's about what's going on um, in soils and in streams and in the ocean relating to production and, and nutrient cycling, um, decomposition and so on. When you start looking at what happens to diversity with ecosystem services, that is with the benefits that we get from nature, um, it's not quite so direct. So here's a set of services, uh, crops, fisheries, wood, biocontrol, climate control, soil. So this is a really complicated diagram. All you need to look at is the direction of the arrow on the right. And if it's going up, that means um, empirically, the more diversity there is, the better that service is. Um, and if the arrow is going down, you want less diversity. And if the arrow is across, uh, there's no real consensus. It depends when you look. So, you know, for food production, um, it can be up or down. Um, it depends what you challenge the crops with, whether it's better to be more diverse or not. Uh, for fisheries and uh, wood production, it's mostly up. For these biocontrol things, it's mostly down because pests are basically diversity and you want fewer of them to remove um, uh, risks from pests. Uh, for a lot of the regulating services, it's up, although sometimes it's mixed. Um, and so it's quite a, it's a much more complicated picture because here you're filtering out. You just want those bits of nature that are really useful to us right now. Okay, so that's a little bit of background about why we might care about biodiversity. And I want to talk a little bit about this planetary boundary. So that's giving you a picture that the, generally the more diversity we have, the better, and particularly genetically, but not always for these very tangible benefits. And um, this, uh, that set of arguments has been used uh, for, by people to talk about how much biodiversity can we lose before we cross some planetary boundary. So there's been this set of questions about whether we're reaching the limits of the Earth. Um, and there have been two measures of it, really. This is the, um, the ecological footprint, the WWF um, Living Planet Report, which says, you know, we moved from living on one Earth, I think, in 1986, and we've been um, borrowing from the future ever since then. This is kind of an accounting exercise. It adds up everybody's use of resources and lays it against uh, what's available and um, shows that we're exceeding available resources. This um, Rockstrom et al. paper, which came out in 2009, is a more systems approach, where they look at these nine planetary systems. And the one that is transgressed um, most extensively is the biodiversity loss one. Uh, the other one that's transgressed is the uh, nitrogen cycle, and the climate is close. So the idea of the planetary boundary is that there's something that we do, that people do to the Earth, that uh, they call this control variable, and that will affect um, the extent of something that matters to the future of the stability of, of the planet. And that if there's a threshold, then you can identify where that is. When we start pumping so much CO2 into the atmosphere that all the sea ice melts, um, there's a clear threshold. 
and then you can op then you can identify a safe operating space so long as we don't put more CO2 than here then everything will be fine <coughs> and each of these boundaries um, that they've identified they go through the process of trying to decide what the control variable is and what the response is so that there's a, a, a and you know about it in their paper so the biodiversity one uh, rather interestingly they use that extinction rate that I showed you they uh, they give a boundary as uh, 10 extinctions per million species years which is much less than we currently have at the moment and that's why the boundary is transgressed so they're saying, oops, sorry. They're saying it should be uh, here, but we're already up there, and that's why we're over the boundary. So I think that's a pretty weird thing to choose as a, as a planetary boundary for, for a number of reasons. Um, one of them being, um, they, they talk about this as being, you know, that, that biodiversity provides essential functions that support biophysical subsystems that any loss can affect ecosystems and that they want this indicator at global aggregate level um, that um, will represent the regulatory role of biodiversity but if you think of their plot like this this is very like what i just showed you i just showed you a, a an, an, an accumulated version of this here are all these ecosystem functions uh, that's production this is decomposition uh, this is decomposition in the plant litter and that's in the soil or something so you get this curve that's like theirs and basically they took they've taken a line here to say how much you can lose so there are lots of problems with that um, one of them is those extinction rates are for vertebrates and they're for certain endemic plant groups not the organisms that are mostly underpinning those ecosystem functions secondly it's local losses that affect ecosystem function, not global biodiversity loss. And so there's this kind of problem of aggregating from, uh, scaling up from local, regional to global level. Um, there's another problem, which is that extinction rate is all about variability, but most ecosystem services don't depend so much on div diversity, but more on biomass. For crops, it's the amount that you produce, not the diversity of the crop types. And in sort of the other way around, um, I think it may be very risk prone in that the level they choose is for current functions rather than looking at this longer term adaptability and resilience, which could depend on much higher levels of diversity, but of different sorts and distributed differently. So. Um, We've been thinking about how else, I'm not sure I actually believe there is a planetary boundary for biodiversity, anyway, but uh, just to show willingness, we've been thinking about how you might create a biodiversity boundary were one to exist or what it might depend on. And so we turned the argument around. Instead of asking about the consequences of progressive biodiversity loss, which is sort of the way it's framed at the moment, we asked a different question, which is what large scale responses in the Earth system that are mediated by, by biodiversity affect its suitability for supporting human societies. So we're just looking at other responses in the Earth system that biodiversity controls that might be important. And um, really just building on some of the things I've already said, there are some obvious candidates in here. So one of them is phylogenetic diversity. Every time you lose some bit of um, diversity, you lose some of that and that means you have less um, capacity for long-term innovation and resilience. As far as we can tell, the shape of this curve is going to be roughly linear. There's no reason to think there's going to be a threshold in it. It might, there may be a little leveling off at the top, but um, at the moment we can't think of any reason why it wouldn't be um, uh, just a straight line or very close to it. Another one is to think about functional diversity. So this is different from species diversity. This is major functions. Um, major metabolic pathways, major trophic pathways um, that, that you would, um, as you lose or uh, as you gain those, you could easily see a stepwise increase in the ecosystem functions and processes that we have. So if we lost all our methanotrophic uh, forms, we'd have no way um, of, of recreating something that could use methane as an energy source and so on. And then the third one which actually I think has lots of promise, is to break 
the world up into these major biomes. And within biomes, it's possible to come up with biome-specific drivers of change. And then your, your Earth system is really just made up a set of subsystems, which are major biomes. So for example, for coral reefs, it's pretty clear that the control variable would be something around carbonate balances. Once the carbonate flux goes to a point where that they can't lay down calcareous skeletons, they're gone. For rainforests, it might be something to do with uh, water cycles. You can easily um, identify a point at which the rainforest will disappear. For the tundra, it could be the uh, rate of thaw of the permafrost. And savanna, it might be something to do with fire frequency or drying or whatever. So you can imagine you could come up with a set of specific uh, control variables for each of these biomes and then measure those and, and use them just as subsystems of the Earth. And that may be a better way to think about the biodiversity boundary than, than the one we have at the moment. So that, that's just some work we're doing right now. And what I quite like about it is it, that, that it sort of splays out into these different uh, timescales. The functional traits within ecosystems are definitely things we should worry about pretty immediately. These are things that are going to help us be resilient to climate change, food crops under climate change, under new um, environments and so on. Um, biome resilience is probably a longer term thing and then the genetic library of life is a very long term thing. Okay, so I'm going to finish just by talking a little bit about some of the approaches that are being used to try and um, reduce the rate of loss of biodiversity and, and, and limit the damage that's being do done to essential ecosystem services. And um, the way I think about this is think about sort of what goes on in ecosystems at the moment and what we rely on them for, food, energy, disease control, climate regulation and so on. And, and what we've been very good at over time is managing ecosystems to do these on their own. We're quite good at managing to produce food. Uh, we've been increasingly good at controlling disease. We're good at recreational landscapes. Um, what we've been bad at is, is um, when these start interfering with each other. And increasingly they do interfere with each other because there's more people and there are more people to feed and so you get these conflicts between food production and wildlife conservation or food production and climate regulation and so on. And that means we can't any longer um, manage all these just one at a time. One set of people are thinking about food, one set of people are thinking about energy, another set of thinking about uh, recreation, another set of thinking about conservation. They're all running into each other because we have a limited amount of land and coastal area to use. And of course these are also driven by these kind of direct drivers to do with climate change, land change, pollution, globalization, which is making this even more difficult. And all that's driven by these remote, uh, more distal processes around sociological economic change and so on. So that if you just think about within this area, we can do this pretty well. Um, one of the things that I think is very clear is that conservation of species and habitats has been successful. When people put their minds to it, uh, we can save species, reverse the decline in habitats and so on. And um, to the extent that we can even see it on this graph I showed you of the rate at which species are heading towards extinction, um, we went back and looked at what would have happened to these with, in the absence of any conservation interventions. And it would have been like the red line had there not been any conservation. So this may not look very impressive, but actually being able to move the bird line from declining like that to like that is due to conservation interventions. We do know how to do it, but it's all at too small a scale. And so actually you can't just do it here. You have to think about um, better land use planning and particularly land use planning in the face of these global changes. And uh, one of the interesting things we did a couple of years ago in the UK National Ecosystem Assessment was to try and do that, to try and run some scenarios where you think about these multiple benefits from the environment collectively, not just one at a time, and do that in a world in which the climate is changing. So we had these two scenarios for managing the UK's landscape, world markets, which is pretty much a business as usual scenario where um, land use is more or less determined by market forces. So you just 
do whatever's going to make the most amount of money, which is mostly high value agricultural crops. And the other one, which we call Nature at Work, which was to look at the multiple values of ecosystems, to try and get all these different uh, values simultaneously. And we just modelled um, what the UK could produce um, and then saw how that would work out under each of these management scenarios. And this is in a high climate change world. So these graphs show you the difference in land value between now and 2080 uh, under high climate change. So this is agriculture, this is greenhouse gas emissions, this is recreational value, this is urban green space, and this is just the biodiversity index, actually a bird species richness measure. So under, under Nature at Work, um, which is the ecosystem services scenario, most of these land uses um, are green, which means the value has gone up compared to today. Under world markets, they're getting more and more red, except for this one. Um, this one is the agriculture one, and the reason it's, um, it's more green than that one is that actually under climate change, agriculture does do pretty well in the UK. And so the value of agriculture um, increases, and the world markets are, are driving it so. But under this one, we're losing all these other kinds of benefits, and in particular, these recreational values, um, the urban green space values, <coughs> are markedly lost. Very red areas where we've lost value under the world market scenario. So you can come up with ways of um, evaluating these different management strategies to get more benefits from the landscape. And I think there's lots more promise for doing this, thinking more broadly about what we want. And of course the great thing about this one is the Nature at Work one uh, turns out to be pretty good at preserving uh, biodiversity, in this case measured as bird species richness. And so there isn't a big cost to biodiversity, which is how it's kind of perceived by, um, by um, activities that just seek to maximise the market value. So why doesn't all that happen? Um, well, uh, to some extent it's to do with gaps in knowledge and information. I think we actually know much more than we think we do. I think the problem is more about uncertainty and when, when do we know enough to actually uh, do something. Um, I think there are huge market failures in current policy mechanisms which um, ought to be soluble but we seem to be a long way from doing that. And I think there's huge problems in environmental governance at all scales that really stall all these <coughs> things. So my conclusion is for biodiversity conservation is that we can't afford not to care um, in a resource hungry world. And I'll just thank some people I've worked with on this. Thank you very much. Covering an enormous amount of ground from the kind of global system down to those very detailed NEA, UK National Nutrition System Assessment maps. Uh, for those of you that uh, don't know the format of these evenings, we have a talk, we then have some questions, and then we go for some refreshments upstairs. So I'm now going to ask people to ask some questions. Um, do make some comments if you'd like to. If I think you're going on too long, I shall tell you so. And please. Tell me, tell us who you are and sort of where you come from, are you UCL, which department, etc., so that we get to know each other a bit. They did that. Hi, um, my name is John Jack, I'm from the Environmental Sciences and Society at UCL. I'm just wondering uh, what you think about biodiversity offsetting, uh, especially <laughs> given that you know, the UK government has been start doing that. Hmm. How long have you got? <laughs> uh, so, okay, okay. So, um, in principle, I think bio so biodiversity offsetting. The idea is um, that if you um, want to develop an area and there's some um, important species or habitat type there, the developer pays to develop an area of comparable quality and quality elsewhere to um, uh, more more than offset what's being lost. And there's a green paper out at the moment. The UK government is very, very keen on biodiversity offsetting and um, is, it's likely to go through. Um, it sounds great. And um, I think there are, I think it's, it's in, in theory, it's a really good thing to do. I have some real concerns about the details and the practice of it. And in particular, I think the extent to which biodiversity offsetting is actually effective 
crucially depends on the metric that's used for this trading between areas. <coughs> and uh, most of the existing systems have a very weak metric that I think allows you to downgrade if you're not very careful. So in principle it's okay, but in practice the devil is in the detail. And, um, and I, think there, I think there are big risks in it. I think there are better, I think this multiple land use planning is a much better way to go. Planning is better than offsetting. In, in my view, offsetting is, um, just demonstrates a failure of planning. Right here. Uh, two questions first of all. Do you um, want to say who you are? I, I'm Amrit Palfield. I study at Newvik. I'm just an environmental enthusiast, really. Um, first of all, I think it's been recent for a couple of hours. Uh, you'll have to, I think you might stand up and speak oh, a bit more okay. loudly, otherwise, it's not a um, private conversation you're having now. Right. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, with you know, insects and other species coming into the UK due to, for example, imports of timber, um, Technically, this increases biodiversity, but what yep. about the actual effect on our forests and native species? Yeah, well, it's, it's a really good question. It's a very complicated one. So, yeah, we, we, there's a lot of um, species, pest species, coming in uh, partly as a function of trade and globalisation. Many of those are benign and uh, either die out or um, just coexist, but there's a very small number that cause very large damage. And, uh, you know, that's the history of a lot of agriculture in the last um, 50 years or so has been dealing with major new pests brought in. And, of course, we have a wave at the moment of, um, of tree diseases caused by pathogens coming in just the same way. So th this is why I was, I was sort of saying that for pest control, biodiversity is a bad thing. We don't want all that variety. We don't want the ones that are actually uh, damaging. So it's not the case that we just always want to maximise diversity. We want the right things in the right places, doing the right stuff. But yeah, it's a very big, it's a very big problem. Hi, I'm Luke Mangalore from Grantham at LSE. So in terms of biodiversity conservation, do you think we need a weak sustainability paradigm or a strong sustainability paradigm? So the weak sustainability says that natural capital is such a little other forms of capital, or just a strict, strong sustainability with you know, this critical natural capital where we need to save these. So what, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I think, uh, I don't understand how weak sustainability works actually, because what you, what you end up having to do is trade off most of the um, natural capital to, with some other kind of capital. And so by definition, natural capital is the, is the bit of productive capacity of the earth that's provided by nature. So we can forego some of it. We might decide we want to get rid of all these pests. That, that would be a good deliberate decision. But I can't understand why we would ever want to forego, for example, uh, the variety of genetic um, diversity on which we might want to base future industries or future resilience. So I, I don't, I, I, yeah, I'm a strong sustainability person. Yes. I'm Helen McFarlane from the Back Conservation Trust. Um, I was wondering, I really like the idea of land use planning as opposed to offsetting, but um, there seems to have been some recent studies that have said that sometimes multi functional landscapes, at least in agriculture, don't always work. Um, and that it might be, you know, agri environment schemes may not seem to be delivering um, and there might be some argument for very intense agriculture in some areas and conservation in others, which seems to go against some of the things that we've been thinking about and the way conservation's been going. But do you have a take on that? And yeah, so, truly multifunctional so, so, so two things. One is that the, the agri-environment schemes are not have not are not what I would call um, good land use planning. They are basically paying farmers not to farm and to just leave stuff and let nature take its course. So in proper planning, you would also be thinking of what, what else they could be doing. What are they planting for carbon sequestration or water regulation? So it's a very the agri environment schemes I think have been really feeble as we've done it. It's just paying farmers not to produce crops. Um, this other debate that you've talked about, which is the kind of land sparing, land sharing thing. So should we just have very intensive food production in some areas and then let nature take its course elsewhere? 
So that's an interesting debate that's sort of largely unresolved at the moment. Um, it, it looks as though <coughs> some species, particularly in the tropics, do not like sharing their landscape with other land uses. And so you end up having to do this land sparing thing where you just do intensification somewhere. In the, in the big um, kind of expansive and already well um, populated areas of the temperate you know, parts of Europe and North America, it's not clear that's the case. But I think we can do very efficient multiple use landscapes without losing lots of agricultural production but gaining lots of other things in terms of biodiversity and other sorts of ecosystem services. But it, it's not, I mean, you know, the evidence is, is a bit contradictory right now. Would you? Yes, so I'm a bit scared of saying who I am and where I work, but um, I'm James Mills. I work for the Department for the Environment, Food and Water Affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, I'm also an economist who works on biodiversity offsetting. Might as well get that. Um, just analysing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question, or maybe not a question, just something I found really interesting was around the time dimension and the fact that it looks like we're not interested in such a range of species now if we're only focused on the uh, direct ecosystem services. And um, but in the future, we'll need all of those other services to be, sorry, species to be resilient and wondering about how you get the value um, that might be thousands of years off taken into account in decisions now. Um, well, you, so you're the economist, James, yeah. here. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, so, so what you can do is um, uh, you can project for, so I don't, you can't, you really can't do anything on those timescales, that's ridiculous. But you can do things over the hundred year time scale where you compare um, the risks of losing certain functions um, by narrowing say the agricultural base or narrowing the forestry base or whatever um, compared to maintaining diversity so that so that curve that I showed you of diversity function relationships there is some quite good data that shows that in different places at different times, different bits of that variability matter. So you can do some of this sort of scenario modeling where you can show the costs of maintaining that diversity, which are sort of opportunity costs. You couldn't then use this over something else compared to what you gain by having those, those sets of biodiversity tools still in, still in hand. And I, and I think it's possible to do that. So, you, so you're kind of, you're just looking at, you know, risks against benefits. George, we clearly need to do some of it. Yeah, yeah. Georgina, can I, can I follow up a couple of questions? Because you know I'm very interested in policy. And so the two areas of policy you've touched on, which I'd like just to explore a little further. One is biodiversity offsetting, the other is agri-environment schemes. Like you, I'm extremely suspicious of the current government plans for biodiversity offsetting mainly because it's quite clear that biodiversity is perceived as a rather annoying constraint yes. on development that yes. is desired. So the motivational uh, issue is absolutely critical. If we had a Secretary of State who was clearly concerned to maintain biodiversity and was proceeding in that manner, I'd be much reassured because I'd be more likely to expect a decent biodiversity offsetting scheme to come out of it. As it is, I'm quite certain <coughs> that what is going to come out is the kind of minimum set of criteria in order to let the developers get on with it, in order to maximize rates of economic growth, because I can see that's actually what the policy um, framework is all about. So the question is, is it possible through the consultation process that will doubtless take place and this will take some time through the Green Paper to come up with a set of criteria that would make any offsetting much more robust because the problem is that it's irreversible. Once you've taken a biodiverse place and turned it into luxury flats, which is kind of what is the subtext, and you've created this little piece of land somewhere in the desert <coughs> northeast, 
um, up there that is supposed to be offsetting. Well, if it doesn't work up in the de desolate northeast, you're not going to, there's nothing you can do about it. It's a kind of irreversible trade off. You've done the bit you wanted to do in the southeast. You've got this thing up there. The Secretary of State have moved on. We've got a new government mm. because that's the way it is. So that's the policy dynamic. And that will happen unless we get these criteria that make it actually very tough for developers to get through the biodiversity offsetting hurdles. And, and I just wonder if you can just comment a bit on that. Yeah. Because so obviously that's your expertise. Then I'll come on to the Andrew environment. Bit. Okay. So, um, so I, I will answer that. And I'll, I'm answering this as an individual and not as a member of the UK's Natural Capital Committee, which might have a different view. Um, so the, the theory of biodiversity offsetting is good, but it only works, as far as I can understand it, if you have some hierarchy, if you have some agreed hierarchy, and the goal is that you have no net loss of biodiversity, because you always trade up that hierarchy. So you always replace the thing you're losing here now with something that has greater value, and that compensates for any potential uncertainty. It's in a different place, or it, it's going to get trashed, or maybe looks after it in 10 years' time, and so on. So you, so you need to have a, a, a way of, you need to have a conservation plan, um, basically, that says this is what we want to maintain, and these are the areas that are better or worse at maintaining on those things. And then you can just trade up and down it. Now, we don't have a conservation plan for England at all. We have a heterogeneous set of policies and practices. And moreover, I think it's really difficult to come up with that priority setting because as I've shown you, there are multiple values of biodiversity. You know, do we like bats or do we like birds? Do we want to keep things that are rare in England but common in Scotland? Or do we want to keep things that are at the edge of their range? They're all over Europe. Um, how much do we worry about habitats compared to species? You know, these are all really these are all really kind of loaded um, issues to which there is no right answer. They're, they're, they're normative questions. So the theory, I think, is good, but the practice of it has many, many risks. And, and I agree with you, it's likely um, to end badly. And particularly because once you've done something bad, it's irreversible. You can't go back. So yeah, I'm pretty skeptical about it. Right, I'll open it up again before I come back to every environment. Lady here. Yeah. Um, uh, Kelly Garner from Black Conservation Trust. Um, one of the things when this question came up when I was in South Africa with biodiversity offsetting is what ha who manages the offset? Yeah. And what happens in the future? Because it might be fine for the next five years while the development's still carrying on or something's still in place. But then the company or the developer's not going to manage that land. So then has to be an entity and do they have the resources and what happens after 50 years? Is that being considered? So uh, in the green paper there are some proposals around covenants and, th and there are various ideas about this. Um, I mean there's also a question of who who's regulating it, you know, who decides yes that's a fair offset, is it the local authority, in which case most of them don't have that competence, is it Natural England, is it some independent authority and you can see very quickly the bureaucracy to support a really sound scheme just becomes rampant and you'd be better off just having a sensible plan to start with rather than creating all this bureaucracy. I, I think you know those kinds of issues, the long-term maintenance. So in, in Australia they have created these um, trust funds that are supposed to support the offset sites in perpetuity, you know, whether, whether they will or not, I don't know. Can I come back to the agri-environment? I mean, I, I remember thinking it was a good thing when we moved from maximize agricultural production, we'd be using all these aircraft hangars to store food that nobody could sell, uh, to paying farmers to produce nothing, uh, letting nature take its course in those areas. Um, it's interesting that you're quite critical of that. At least you don't count that as a conservation plan. No, I, I did sort of conservation. But. Um, <laughs> What else, what would one do instead, in the sense that, I mean, these are farmers, they're not biodiversity managers. Yeah. Some of them know quite a lot about biodiversity management, but some of them know absolutely diddly squat about it. Yeah. And they have sort of farm managers who've been employed in, and they're just there to produce crops, because that's what they do. Yeah. So what, how might one get a reform of common agricultural policy that would do something different, that didn't cost a whole lot more money? So, 
So I think, I think that's reasonably straightforward, that you say to farmers, you, you, we used to pay you to produce food, and that was the primary goal. Now we're, calling, we're going to make you custodians of the landscape. And you need to manage the, the, the landscape for these many benefits that people need from it. And that is all these kind of things we need. We need landscapes that um, provide good recreational values, that have um, good carbon sequestration, that um, provide natural water regulation, natural decomposition. And you can measure all these things. We know how to measure all those benefits. And you reward farmers who manage the landscape to deliver those. Have they got the skills to do that? Well, no, but we can easily, they might, I bet they do actually. I, to be honest, some of the things to do with water, um, particularly soil quality, they know how to do that. And, and it would be very, well, not very easy, but it's, it's reasonably straightforward to think you could come up with a manual for what we want from the landscape of which you are a particular custodian, and you w reward them for doing that. And I think that's how a lot of the Pillar 2 stuff for the cat reforms is heading.